same play? <laughs> Attention must be paid. All right, for one more day of <clears throat> Ralph Waldo Emerson. I, uh, I thought about how to handle this last session, and the problem with Emerson is that there is an enormous amount of material to read. If you look at your text, you'll see a lot of that. And Emerson does take time. And rather than focus on one essay today and, uh, and, and work with it, well, even in two hours, you can't do one essay thoroughly, but uh, even with, uh, with that, one essay reasonably thoroughly, I decided that it's probably better for us to do some hop, hopping and skipping and jumping. So what I'm going to do is start off with a poem, and then we'll start with the American Scholar, and I will pick a few paragraphs through a series. I have about six essays in this text that I'd like to just step down on for a minute. I think it's easier, easier going, too, for you. And then what you might do as on your own, if you find Emerson interesting, is pick the essay that appeals to you and, uh, and sit down and push it a little bit farther than I, than I push it in class. But I want to look today at the American Scholar and Circles and maybe the skeptic, and faith, and the transcendentalist. <coughs> we'll see how far our two hours take us. We'll start off with a poem, because I think we're going to change the pace tonight. But <coughs> in the past, I've given you a couple of timelines. We talk about literary reputation, and before I go to the poem, I thought I would speak to you about Emerson's reputation and how he's uh, evolved over the years. Because literary reputations are interesting phenomena. They do not they do not all have the same outline. And if you remember in college, you probably were taught that there are certain classical outlines, say, to the structure of a play. Uh, the drama in a tragedy, you watch the tra tra tragic hero rise to a peak and then uh, right, and the downfall all the way. And that's like Beth who gradually acquires power and then his uh, crimes catch up with him and then fare thee well like Beth, that type of thing. If you play with that in terms of literary reputation, Emerson has one of the most interesting ones because it, has, it says a lot about our social assumptions or presumptions as Americans. And let's uh, start off with a couple of other writers to show how this works. We did uh, Hawthorne and Short Stories a couple of years ago, I believe it did. And uh, when, you, when you think about the career of Hawthorne, you find a man who worked pretty much in uh, oblivion for his apprentice years. In, Emerson, in, in Hawthorne's early years, he published his short story through an annual uh, anonymously. So nobody knew who was writing these short stories. And then when Tales uh, from the Wayside Inn came out, and, and his name was attached to his story, he was immediately recognized in the eye of the critic, in the eye of the public, as a major American writer. And when Hawthorne published The Scarlet Letter, that was it. And this man, his reputation as an American author reached a peak with his first major novel, and it has stayed that way ever since. So Hawthorne's reputation is roughly like that. There's not been a time since 1850 when Hawthorne was not considered by American readers and American critics to be, when he was not considered to be probably the first major American writer of fiction. Nobody has ever denied the greatness of that writer. No one's personal preferences may or may not. Uh, then towards Hawthorne. If you take that as Hawthorne, here he is all the way up to 1980, still constantly being perceived where he belongs. If you take perhaps the greatest American novelist, you get an extremely interesting, uh, an extremely interesting line. Uh, Herman Melville reached fame immediately upon the publication of his first novel, which was Taipei. He went up like this. Taipei was a an English-speaking world bestseller sold thousands of copies in America and in England. It was uh, what made him known throughout the English-speaking world as a man who lived among cannibals. It was an adventure story, in a sense, about what happened to him when he jumped ship off the whaler and lived with the cannibals for three months in the Marquesa Islands. And with every novel Melville wrote, his uh, audience dropped. They wanted him to write adventure stories, and Melville did not want to write adventure stories. He wanted to write Moby Dick, as you know, and nobody wanted to read Moby Dick. So as he would write, he wrote Omu, and then he wrote White Jacket, and he wrote a series of novels. The first several of them sold fairly well because the audience that had read Taiki bought them expecting more adventures among cannibals. As Melville grew as a writer, he became less attractive to the popular audience. 
And when he wrote Moby Dick, uh, he was pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back. He followed that up with a totally unreadable book called Pierre, which is a fascinating book, but one of the hardest books you'll ever have to read if you ever have to read it. And his <coughs> reputation after that simply went to the floor. To the latter part of Melville's life, if he went by a timeline, he'd be down here someplace. I mean, less than, uh, less than unknown, and actively rejected. <laughs> so he's the only term for it. When Melville died in 1891, uh, nobody knew who he was. I mean, that was he was just lost the public entirely. He went through a period of oblivion, and in 1920, Melville was rediscovered by a biographer who published his fame. And at that point, Melville's interest re reoccurred, in interest in him, and right through the ceiling. And since roughly 1925, 1930, Melville has stayed up as probably the premier American writer of the 19th century. Uh, in most people's eyes, greater than Hawthorne or Twain or you name it, Melville's book is the deepest, uh, the most uh, impressive creation. It's a very curious uh, structure. It's a pity the man died in ignominy, oblivion. <laughs> Let's just try another one, though. So that's a sample. Henry James, for example, reached prominence after years of slow work with short novels and, and long novels. And his, his line looked something like this. As he became accepted by the literary community, and James has been the writer's, the writer's writer for the rest of his time. And he most changed the theory of the novel, how fi what fiction should be about. If we turn to our gentleman today, we get an extremely curious phenomenon because he is linked in the eyes of everybody who's a reader with his uh, student. He is the mentor of Henry David Thoreau, and you cannot think about Emerson without thinking about Thoreau. Emerson talked about what it was to be an independent person, and theoretically Thoreau was the man who went out and was independent. Uh, the fact that they had somewhat different geniuses has usually held against Emerson. Because Thoreau was constantly held up to people as, here's a man who did what Emerson said people ought to do, but didn't do himself, if you recall. Moreover, their reputations are attached to America's uh, social phenomena in ways that no other writers are. This is what, what they would look like if you went by, right? This is Emerson, and this is Thoreau. <laughs> they are complementary, harmonic. When America is in uh, socially comfortable and good times, and people are fairly confident, feeling pretty well about themselves, those are the days that Emerson is respected. Because Emerson is a man who in his own life not only asks that you have confidence in yourself and in the world around you and in your ability to get in touch with yourself, but who should live a fairly confident and good life. And when the values of Emerson's life, not his ideas, but his life, are valued, then Emerson is valued. Because Emerson himself is a man who married twice, and his first wife died young. He loved his wife, he had a family, raised his children, lived in a white clapboard house. There's the conservative values of American society are represented by Emerson's living. Whereas his ideas, however revolutionary they may be, were not seen to be revolutionary by the people who watched him. That a clear Whereas Thoreau, who was raised in a fairly comfortable family, got a Harvard education, then went out and lived a radical life. So if you find America in a comfortable time economically, then Emerson is pretty much respected. He has been, I think, strongly depowerized, taking power away from somebody, depowerized, <laughs> made palatable, right? And times when we are under pressure and stress and economics are not good, then Thoreau will rise to the top. When I first started teaching college students in the 60s, he was all Thoreau. And college students wouldn't listen to Emerson at all. They, they accused him of not living up to his own principles, that here was a man who sat in his library and said, this is what one ought to do. And actually, Thoreau went out there and did it. Like Thoreau, who did not marry, didn't have children, wouldn't take responsibility for his life, was uh, ideal for the late 60s. And everybody was protesting about everything else. And Emerson was simply persona non grata. In the 1970s, kept on teaching, Thoreau became less and less uh, exciting, and students started saying about Thoreau, he's an egocentric maniac, he doesn't think about anybody but himself, right? What about people who have, and at the, just as Thoreau drops in prestige, 
our eminence, Emerson rises. And people start saying, well, Emerson was a man who accepted the responsibilities of life. He never did stop being revolutionary, but being revolutionary does not mean you have to burn down buildings, after all, uh, which is what I believe. Uh, I think Emerson lived the life he wanted to live. His life happened to include a wife and children, and a white clavered house, and so, <laughs> but he was high, high enough to do it on his own, on his own principles. So what I wanted to point out to you was this curious contrast that these two writers have. There's, there's no doubt that each one of them is important to us. Emerson would be less to us had he not had Thoreau to sort of offer himself as an example of somebody who looked at himself and said, what do I have? And Walden is the great, if not the greatest, experiment, literary experiment and exploration of self that has ever been produced. Nothing is quite like it. Thoreau is as essential to us as as Emerson is. But the truth is, without Emerson, there would be no Thoreau. Uh, Emerson was a man who uh, germinated Thoreau's ideas. He loaned him the land on which he could build Walden, the, the cabin. And he was right there across the fence every time Thoreau wanted a hot supper. Mrs. Emerson was there to make it for him. So you might, you might sense from my conversation that I like teaching Walden and I like Thoreau. I think he's a masterful writer, maybe the greatest stylist he produced. But my interior bias is all toward Emerson. I really do really admire this man in ways that, that I do not admire Thoreau, who I feel is somewhat egocentric and short tempered of other people who saw weaknesses. Emerson was a generous man who never condemned other people for being what they were, and still called them to be better than they were at the same time. And Thoreau was somewhat condemnatory. You know, he didn't like the Irish people, which gets my Irish gander up <laughs> when you think about it. All the same. So that was. Right now, we are, therefore, can you guess in which cycle, which part of the foot writer is? Yeah, we're very much moving towards the uh, Emersonian cycle. And it's only, well, if the economy goes the way it has been going, Thoreau will be up on the market again next fall, so buy your Thoreau stock soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tough times may be here. Yes. He was highly respected, but suspicious. Uh, it, it, you cannot read Emerson closely and not see that the man's radical. But what he asks is that you find your strength in yourself. And in the society which asks that you find strength in the world outside of you, that's a radical thought. But Emerson has been D, D, I can't it must be a D word. That would fit. And if you remember your childhood, and what you learned in grade school, it's amazing how Emerson can turn into some sort of marshmallow thinker. Remember? They all these little sayings that sound sweet and nice, and, and they're, 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 they're knitted into uh, needle pointed into cushions and things like that. <laughs> Whereas what Emerson was most asking was that you get out of that and really take a cold, hard look at what it is to be a human being and what you've got in it. Um, I, I remember Emerson as a boring writer. I was bored to tears by him. And it's only teaching him that made me realize this man is, is so unboring. There's hardly, hardly anybody who's less boring than he is. Because he shakes things up all the time, consciously asks us to, to look at ourselves and what are the reasons for our actions. But, uh, yeah. Existential in the sense that Emerson asks us, as the Romantics do. I mean, the existential philosophical stance is a product of the Romantic period. You cannot be an existentialist before 1797, not in English, uh, because the existentialist is a person who examines itself, so it is to be an I, have a lie. Uh, and there are consequences, Emerson. But the, the language he would use is transcript, which is a broader, less, uh, less destructive way of consequence of existentialism is despair, because you are in a sense alone. And Emerson would have none of that. And Emerson would say, yes, you have nothing to rely on but yourself, but that's the case of everybody, so you can all do it together. <laughs> and that gives a tremendous power to Emerson. Also, Emerson has a strong belief in the goodness that you'll find there if you look. Now, I know a student, I have a student right now who hates himself. And it's a hard message to send to somebody, hey, look inside yourself and find something worth reading on when that person looks inside himself and sees nothing but a terrible evil hole that something to fall into. 
And you, that is, you cannot make Edgar Allan Poe an Emersonian, no matter how much you want to, because it has to do with how you view the world. And Poe was terrified with his Poe, because he talked about him. And death was terribly frightening, but not to Emerson. Someplace along the line, we have to put our books down and say, here's where I stand. My desire is to be Emersonian. My philosophical stance is to be more Melvillian. I like Melville's complexity of perception. I like the marvelous argument of Ishmael and Moby Dick, which recognizes in a way that I don't think Emerson does the turmoil and tempestuousness. You've read Moby Dick. Do you remember the passage where he's taught they've gone into the whales? He's been dragged in the middle of the whales that are being attacked on the outside by the, uh, the whalers. And so he's dragged in, and he finds that here they are, trapped in the middle. It is, I think it's the high point of 19th century American literature when Ishmael says this. He comes in and he sees young whales are making love, and the babies are there, and the mother whales are feeding or nursing their pups, or whatever you call baby whales. And, he's, and Ishmael thinks, he's a great thinker about what it is to be human, and he says, this, this is life. And life is terror and turmoil out here where all these whales are being harpooned. But if you get through to the interior, right, he says, I have inside me a great lake or, or center of peace and joy. And that the secret to living is keeping someplace inside of you a refusal, you call it peace or joy, but a refusal to say, this is life in here. See, Melville, for me, recognizes much more uh, vividly the difficulties of life than Emerson does. And today I want to show you how Emerson does make an effort to do that. My suspicion is that he doesn't really get it inside. And, and, and Melville does. And that's why in the end I would be a Melvillian. His life is harder than Emerson thought. But he's recognized that in his heart. I wish I were Emersonian. But, but Emersonian is not as Emersonian as you, Emerson is not as Emersonian as you were taught. That it's more. And so later on this hour, after break, we'll come to faith. And he says, hey, limitation is life. And you start out saying, I can do anything that you want. Bread, God, stars, you name it. And growing up is realizing that no one. Every one of my sophomores thinks he's going to become president of the United States. Life is realizing that all is what Mark Twain turned, and turned Mark Twain into, into cynicism and, uh, and misery. Life is an endless closing of doors. Is it not? All those things you might have been and did not become. Now, how do you respond to it? I wish I were Emerson. I hope you all are. My own sense is I'd like to try over once more that life is you're not trying over to get one shot at this gold ring. And most of us saw it go by long ago. Right? So, so it's, a, it's a curious and intellect, an interesting intellectual stance. Emerson is not closed. But he's also a man who really does believe that we can make the best of it. And I like that. And that's why I like teaching Emerson. Because he reminds me of strengths that I would like to rely on. Let's look at a, a poem here before we go back to the prose. Turn to page 426, Uriel. Here you get a sense of what <clears throat> Emerson opposes and what he believes in. This is a myth about <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, the angels. Uriel is a, an angel who gets a, a bad insight into truth. And one of Emerson's uh, pleasures was putting orthodoxy. Or he used to like to stick the needle in, in uh, 19th century images of God and so forth. It fell in ancient periods which the brooding soul surveys, or ever the to wild time coined itself into calendar months and days. It starts, once, once upon a time, is what that stanza says. And what it means is that this occurrence happened long before the world had organized itself into 30, 365 days a year, 12 months, uh, 52 weeks, all of that business. This is pre-time, in other words, before God said what they'd be like. This was the lapse of Uriel, <coughs> which in paradise befell. Once among the Pleiades walking, the Pleiades are seven stars in the sky, and the angels up there walking. 
said, that is the poet, overheard the young god talking and the treason too long hence. To his ears was evident. The young deities discussed laws of form and mutual just. Orb, quintessence, and sunbeams, what subsisteth and what seems. Okay, here are these angels, they're going about and what they're doing, in essence, is talking about the laws of nature. God has created nature with all these laws, the laws of gravity, the laws of action and reaction. And the angels are going about and they're like good, obedient servants to God, they're saying, my, aren't these laws wonderful? Isn't it nice that God made these laws of nature for everything to work properly together? Laws are just great. They give us structure and order, makes us understand the sequence of time, you name it. But there's one angel who doesn't care for order, per se. One, in other words, you with low tones that decide and doubt and reverend use defied. With a look that solved the sphere and stirred the devils everywhere, gave his sentiment divine against the being of a line. One angel says, I don't like lines. I don't like straight things. Line in nature is not found. Unit and universe are round. We'll be reading a little bit in circles later on. Emerson believes strongly in the circle as a central image of unifying life. Not division, but unity. And what this angel is saying is that in nature you don't get stuff like this. And this is a this is a mind creation. Nothing is straight in nature. The one thing you might get in nature is circularity, repetition. In vain produced all rays return. Evil will bless. I see. I always have to stop with him when he asks hard questions. But this, is, this is especially interesting because it's only in post uh, post uh, uh, Einstein and physics that we understand that this is true. You produce a line, like the line of sunlight, a beam. In the Emerson's day, the idea was that that went straight. And a line, but that was that was is it Newtonian physics? Wham. But this angel is saying, oh, no, it always comes back. And in fact, that's true, isn't it? I mean, so scientists know today that, that the line that divides or that shoots out always, even in terms of light, creates. And the theory I take in astronomy is that the universe itself is curved, isn't it? And if you went straight up <coughs> into the universe, you come back where you were. So it's an closed system, in a sense. Emerson knew this uh, years ago. Unit and universe are wrong. You don't need all these astronomers. In vain produced all rays return. Evil will bless and ice will burn. Can you guess what that means then? Emerson is talking, speaking against dogmatic distinctions. He doesn't believe that you can divide everything into good and bad, into white and black into tall and short. The desire of the mind to, to disorganize things neatly. Oh, that act is a good act. No. There's no way of knowing. I mean, in the long run, after 300 years, the major and all that Nixon was a blessing. It's hard to see it now, but we don't know the consequences of that. Ice can burn. It's all relative, isn't it? If you take ice, 32 degrees, as your standard, and you set that up against boiling, it's awful cold, but if you set it up against perfect zero, 450 degrees below zero, it's terribly hot. You see the Emerson's point? It, 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 it is how you see something that establishes its its meaning. And if you think I've got everything nicely organized so that, uh, what is the truth? The first one is evil is evil and never does any good, and cold is cold and never gets hot, then you're just limiting your perception of things so greatly that you'll never understand the reality of Bad, bad deeds do often result in good. Good deeds result in bad. Hot can be cold. Cold can be hot. You can get burned by carbon dioxide, can't you? <coughs> However cold it is. It's an interesting idea. 
So what he's, what he's attacking is dogmatic distinctions, easy assumptions. As Uriel spoke with piercing eye, a shudder ran around the sky. The stern old war gods shook their heads. The seraphs frowned from Virgil's bed. Seemed to the holy festival, the rash word voted ill to all. The balanced beam of faith was bent. The bounds of good and ill were rent. Strong Hades could not keep his own, but all slid to confusion. Interesting. The bounds of good and ill were rent. If you live a life in which good actions and evil actions are neatly divided into categories, then what Uriel says is terribly dangerous. Because Emerson is going to say that good and evil have to be seen in context. What is evil in one context may in fact be good in another. And if you like a simplistic world, then you don't want to look at Emerson. Because you're not going to be given, given, so it's going to be right. Could I do this? Any of you who've been mothers of teenagers know how hard it is when some child is making moral decisions. And the question is always really more complicated than it seems to be. Should I smoke? Well, that's an easy question. That's uh, no. And most of the questions are not that easy. What happens when you first have to stand on some moral principle and you find out that you're not simplistic? That's an interesting point. It's so bad, Emerson says, that Hades itself gives up its myth. It's going to be life and death. Why would a person be in Hades? Well, why not? If the ability to say, go to heaven and go to hell, disappears in this sort of relativistic uh, universe. A sad self-knowledge, withering, fell on the beauty of Uriel. In heaven, once eminent, the god withdrew that hour into his cloud, whether due to gyration, to long gyration in the sea of generation, or by knowledge grown too bright to hit the nerve of feebler sight. Straightway, a forgetting wine that green stole over the celestial kind, and their lips the secret kept within ashes and fire seed. What does God do to solve this problem? Uriel is sent away. He's hidden. And then God goes over all the angels who've heard this very upsetting news. And forget it, kid. You didn't hear what you just heard. So it's deeply buried in the subconscious of all the angels in heaven that maybe things aren't as cut and dried as they used to think in their innocence and blissfulness. But now and then, truth speaking things shame the angels' veiling wings. And shrilling from the solar course, or from the fruit of chemic force, procession of a soul in matter, or the speed of change of water, or out of good of evil born, and Muriel voice of terror scorn, and the blush tinged the upper sky, and the gods shook, and do not lie. But Emerson is saying here that life is actually consistently going to give us clues that maybe things aren't as simple as we would like them to be. And every time they do, the gods, deep in their psyche, someplace, realize that they're living a lie. They're living a lie. You can't set up those Ten Commandments and say, this is always what's good. And this is always what is bad. Because someday you will see that some evil act has created good. And when you see that, you're going to have to... The blush is the blush of shame, isn't it? It's shame that one asserts or claims a simplistic universe when the universe is not simple. Yeah. Absolutely. I wouldn't say relative morality, but certainly situational ethics. That is, an act can only be seen in the context of its, of its action. And there are times, take the worst crime of all, murder. Murder is about considered traditionally. The, are there times when murder is justified? I think most of us would say, if I, ca if I caught a man harming my wife and children, I probably would kill him with pleasure. I wish I hadn't done it. But the relative act of murder in that instance, as opposed to taking out a gun and shooting somebody here, is so radically different that when you talk in simplistic terms of all human life is sacred. Many of you have relatives, I think, who fought in World War II. There, there is a one of the lessons we learned in, this, in the Vietnamese War was the fact that, that fighting in a war is a relative act, isn't it? And fighting against the Nazis, 
probably is, in, in relative terms, a vastly more positive, morally justified act than fighting against the good and evil. And we get it. It's one of the lessons that we learned. If not a lesson, at least it was something we learned as a community, that we had not convinced ourselves and the nation that the Vietnamese War was in fact justified the way the war against the Japanese, the war against the Germans. So most of us, whatever our position on the war, would see that someplace along the line we have to be convinced, don't we? I, I, I would find it a terrible obligation to pull out a gun and shoot somebody. But I can imagine that it might come about. And I would not berate myself for having done it. It is. People don't listen to this in Emerson. They do not. It fits in because Emerson allows us not to have to leave that home, among other things. You can choose with Emerson what appeals to you. Another point, if you take something like this poem and put it in, not in radical terms, uh, I'm trying to find something that would get you sort of emotionally stirred up for that, for that example, but if you put it in the normal terms of your life, you can see the consequences of it are not as radical. And most of us do not think about such things. But the normal moral decisions in, in life, if we think about them after having read this poem the way he would like us to, are decisions which can force us to stop. And Emerson always asks us to reevaluate, reappraise what we do. And that's the force of this. It's not as revolutionary in other words in practice as it is in theory. What Emerson does not want us to do is to do something because the priest said to do it, or the minister said to do it. He says that's not good. That's just as I said, it's obedient. If you want to be a good person, you have to find the moral code in yourself and then apply that in a, a certain fashion. It is not relativistic in another sense. Emerson doesn't have any doubt whatsoever that if you find that code in yourself and apply it, you're not being random. This is what he said in the, in the essay we wrote in the last week. So why are you not a sensualist in that case? His language, in other words, why aren't you out there living a hedonistic life with pleasure and good times and women? All these things. Wine, women, and songs. He says, I'm not a sensualist because that is not what a good man does in my sense of what goodness is. And you take that one step further, and Emerson would say, if you look in your heart, you would all agree with me. Like that a frivolous life is not a good life. And that none of us who looks closely into our interiors, though I give you the freedom to do that, would be that kind of life. See, he does believe that when you get down into the interior, we would, in essence, all be living the same life as we're leading now as good people, but for the right reason instead of the wrong reason. And that's a crucial point about it. He doesn't believe that people who find the truth in their, in, in their insides would become evil people. And they would be like him. They would marry good women and have good children and pay their debts and, because he did it for the right reason. But you see, in Emerson's sense, that he could be neighbors with somebody who lived exactly the same life. And that other person is just living a shell of a life. See? Whereas he himself might say, I agree because I know what I'm doing. It's knowledge that Emerson wants. Yeah. All of his poems, all of his essays are to get us to step back and say, why do I do what I do? Who am I? What are my standards? And that self-examination leads to Thoreau, who when he wrote Walden said, well, what I want to do is to get away from all the structures that oppress me and say to myself, all right, what can I live with? Who is Henry David Thoreau? And if you've read Walden, I think most of you have probably at one time or another, at the end of that book, Thoreau says, now, don't get me wrong. I didn't ask you to go build a cabin in the woods. That was my technique. But go and build your own woods, metaphorically, and find out who you are. And if you find out right, as Emerson believed, you'd be in accord with Emerson. In fact, that's a good point to turn over to the American scholar. So to flip to the front of your book, <coughs> and look to the essay right after nature. Turn to page 64. <coughs> <coughs> this is one of his best statements in his early years. This is even before uh, self-reliance, which we did last week, about what he wants us to do as people. Here he talks about an old fable. He says, there was an old fable that covers a doctrine ever new and sublime. Find that? 64. That there is one man, capital letters, present to all particular men only partially. 
or through one faculty, and that you must take the whole society to find the whole man. And that's very platonic, by the way. You see the connection with Plato's philosophy there. We are merely representatives of something abstract that is the real uh, truth. You can't understand mankind by looking at Gary, only by putting them together and imagining what the real humanity is. He says that what we do is live partial life of necessity. What we do then, not of necessity, but of failure to perceive, is define ourselves by our partiality, what we are as unique people. Man is not a farmer, or a professor, or an engineer. He is all. In a divided or social state, these functions are parceled out to individuals, each of whom aims to do his stint of the joint work, while each other performs his. The fable implies that the individual, to possess himself, must sometimes return from his own labor to embrace all the other laborers. But unfortunately, this original unit, this fountain of power, has been so distributed to multitudes, has been so minutely subdivided and parceled out, peddled out, that it is filled into drops and cannot be gathered. The state of society is one in which the members have suffered amputation from the trunk and strut about so many walking monsters, a good finger, a neck, a stomach, an elbow, but never a man. Do you see the point? We tend to define ourselves, well, what are you? I'm, I'm teaching students, I say, ah, you are a high school sophomore. Obviously, we know what you are, a sophomore. Yeah, you are a college senior. Very good. I am a teacher. I am a professor. And the languages, as soon as you put the words on, they create preconceptions, don't they? What are you? I am a retired person. Ah, senile. Now we know. <laughs> they, come with, they come with all this bag and baggage. And as long as we allow those words to define ourselves, we become, as he says, a portion, a finger. I'm a finger because I... Uh, there's a good stomach over there. The, the only way to be human is to is never to allow our our duties, our roles, to become ourselves totally, be defined by ourselves. Man is thus metamorphosed into a thing, into many things. The planter, who is man sent out into the field to gather food, is seldom cheered by any idea of the true dignity of his mastery. He sees his bushel and his cart and nothing beyond and sinks into the farmer instead of man on the farm. Now he's using man. We know, we know what he means as human, a human being on the farm. If you call yourself farmer instead of a human being who farms, you are by definition limiting yourself to a role that you won't even be able to use the language to understand what it is to be human. You are always human first, is what Emerson says. And then whatever else you are. And you're a variety of things, aren't you? Grandmother, mother, teacher, you name it. All those things, but always a human being first. It's a very human-oriented philosophy, as you can see. The tradesman scarcely ever gives an ideal worth to his work, but is ridden by the routine of his craft and the, sub the soul is subject to dollars. The priest becomes a form, the attorney a statute book, the mechanic a machine, a rope, a sailor, a rope of a ship. In this distinction of function, the scholar is the delegated intellect. In the right state, he is man thinking. In the degenerate state, when the victim of society, he tends to become a mere thinker, or still worse, the parent of other men. The point. Emerson believes very strongly that none of these roles that we live as people is better than another role. It's just that we do different things. The poet is man speaking. The scholar is man thinking. But the farmer is man growing food. So whatever your role is, it's an important part. You are all brothers in terms of your humanity. And he says most of us live lives in which we denigrate ourselves and limit ourselves and until we start thinking of ourselves as human being surviving in whatever role I've been given as my gift, we can't respect each other properly or understand our own value, our own worth. There is no intrinsic superiority in the position 
over a man paving the street. You need them both. And a, and, a, and a physician is just a plumber of the body, right? It is a technician. A plumber of the, of the sink is, is more important than a physician when your toilet is stopped up, right? You hear what he's saying? It's a marvelous elevation of it. Getting rid of the, of the intrinsic superiority. Oh, I am really important because I have gone to so many years of school, and you are merely a tradesman. If you start respecting other people's humanity, Emerson says, you will be respecting yourself. And if you denigrate the man you buy your meat, your meat from, you are denigrating yourself as well, and you are that much less a person than the consequence of that. So he says, we've got to cha change our language. The farmer is human being farming. And a farmer you cannot live without. Uh, what is it? Is it even in the Bible where there's an argument between the parts of the body? Okay. It's in the New Testament. Doesn't Paul talk about the argument between the head and the brain and the stomach and the, the feet? And the only solution is? you got to work together. you got to work together. Well, this is an American scholar. Turn to the 67 for another paragraph. This is one of my favorite Emerson paragraphs. I love to read it to students. If you have a belief in yourself as the scholar, it's important to come to Emerson someplace to get a dose of what it is to be a scholar. Because what most students do in college and some in high school is uh, sit in libraries and read other people's work. And Emerson's point is that you are no scholar at all unless you are creative. There is naturally, there's a certain amount of taking in of previous ideas. But a major flaw in human response to the world around them is worshiping the completed acts of other people. And Emerson says, be careful, because Shakespeare can enfeeble you. If you read Shakespeare, Milton, I'm doing Chaucer right now with my seniors, Chaucer, and you, you come to something like King Lear, and you have aspirations to create yourself, and your response is, right? And what's the use of, what is the use of writing? And I can't possibly do it. Then you're misreading Shakespeare entirely. He says, the only reason to read great works is not for the artifact, the product, but to get near the act of creation. It's coming near creativity that makes that makes Shakespeare important because when he wrote, he was being created, and that's to spur you to be created. That we all, <coughs> excuse me, in Emerson's eyes, have access to creative, creative uh, ideas. So here is Emerson on the scholar. Each age, the end of the previous paragraph, it is found must write in its own books, page 67. Or rather, each generation for the next succeeding. The books of an older period will not fit this. You cannot stop creating because everything has been done. Yet, hence arises a great mischief. The sacredness which attaches to the act of creation, the act of thought, is transferred to the record. And so you make the Bible out of the works of Shakespeare. Um, I mean, one of you has a, showed me a beautiful edition of Emerson's work. Who was that, Heather? Yeah. It's a beautiful book. When Emerson would find in his philosophy, thoroughly, repulsive, a beautifully bound book, the works of Emerson. It looks like a Bible, see? And he would say, my gosh, and, I, and she showed it to me, and look at that beautiful print. And, and you know me, I'm a book collector. <laughs> I love books as artifacts. I like to see the pages, and I like to hold them, and read them, and think of who had them before. And Emerson would say, all of this is perfectly for Just put it on a piece of paper and read it. It's the idea that's important. So we see all this glorification of the artifact. The act of thought is transferred to the record. The poet chanting was felt to be a divine man. Henceforth, the chant is divine also. The writer was a just and wise spirit. Henceforward, it is settled the book is perfect, as love of the hero corrupts the worship of his statue. Remember what he said? Every good and wise person sways me more than he ought. Anybody who stands in front of me is a good person makes me think, I wish I was like him. I wish I was like her. And they shouldn't. All they should do is be spurs onto one's own. The sluggish and perverted mind of the multitude, slow to the incursions of reason, notice the capital R, reason here means the intuitive perception of truth. It doesn't mean logic slow to the encouraged incursions of reason, having once so open, having once received this book, stands upon it and makes an outcry if it is disparaged. If we get the public to finally understand Hamlet, and, and it took them centuries to understand it, as soon as they love it, 
boy, that's it. That's the Bible. You say a word against Hamlet, and you might as well be like having the verses on Christ. They just take it to their soul. Colleges are built on it. Books are written on it by thinkers, not by man thinking. By men of talent, that is, who start wrong, who set out from accepted dogmas, not from their own sight of principles. Remember, I said, always look for any word of the vision. Not from seeing themselves, but from taking somebody else's dogmas. Meek young men grow up in libraries, believing it's their duty to accept the views which Cicero, which Locke, which Bacon have given, forgetful that Cicero, Locke, and Bacon were only young men in libraries when they wrote those books. <laughs> if, if Cicero and Locke and Bacon had done what we do, we wouldn't have their work because they'd have spent the whole time in the UW library reading other people's work, reading Thomas Aquinas and Milton and Shakespeare. The only way you get creation is to create. And if you use books for any other purpose, So there is an essay. This essay was given to the Phi Beta Kappa Society, the American scholar. As you know the journal. But he was speaking to some of the most uh, prestigious intellects of his day, warning them not to fall into that trap of adoration of the past. Emerson does not believe the past should be. The past should really show us what it went through and give us inspiration to do it our, our own way. I hope a lot of you are getting uh, bells ringing in your mind reminding you of Walt Whitman. Because when we did a song of myself last year, if you recall, this was one of Whitman's great changes, right? Priests, scholars, you're all right in your own way, but get away. Right now it's time for Walt <laughs> to get to it himself on his own. Okay, let's uh, turn over half the American scholar. Which, if you look at my text, you see I've got marvelous things in here, but we're not going to look at them. We're going to go on. <coughs> On page uh, 97, you see the chapter that's dealing with the Divinity School Address. This, uh, I'm not going to stop at now, but it was a crucial time in Emerson's life. This Divinity School Address was given at Harvard Divinity School, and it was Emerson's first public attack on accepted dogma in the church. He really goes after orthodoxy here. And it was such a shocking event that he was denied access to Harvard Divinity School in his pulpit or his podium for many years, I think it was 30 or 40 years before he was allowed back. He tremendously insulted the conservative Christian establishment of his day with this, which people forget today when they see him sort of being one of our uh, honorable saints of the 19th century. But he was not afraid to stand in front of the Divinity School in Harvard and attack them at their, at their most tender spots. And they never forgave him for doing this. So I won't stop with this. If you're interested in theology, um, I would recommend you sit down and read this one. Anybody who's, uh, who has will find it quite interesting. Did you ask him something similar? I mean, um, he was preaching against so many of the gods. Yeah, the difference is that Ruskin was more o more oriented towards art. Yes. He was a great recreator of artistic vision. But, uh, yeah, that's right. He, uh, Ruskin was a new seer. And his, uh, if you read uh, Stones of Venice, for example, what he was doing was picking up, Emerson was there first. It is picking up this sense of you have to see things right to understand what they are. Also, Ruskin was never as much a member of the establishment as, uh, as Emerson was. Yeah, very strange man. Yeah. And Emerson lived a, a normal life, and Ruskin did not. Um, that's a different issue entirely. But he Ruskin was clearly. Well, I want to say to pronounce the university. <coughs> he started the name just like everybody else in where he sat. Did he? He was bored with a preacher, probably. <laughs> But there's a, there is an, uh, that's a very complex issue. Ruskin was not a, a normal human being. And that's he was. A very strange person. But one, you know, he was a great writer and an enormous influence. The writer who should come to mind when you read Emerson, and I almost certainly will not unless you know something about Emerson, it turned out to be a very good friend and correspondent. He corresponded with Emerson for years in the 19th century, but I bet you won't guess who it is. Can you guess who it is? The British writer? known for his cranky idiosyncrasy. Not Macaulay. Carlyle, yes. Of all people, Emerson and Carlyle, they hit it, hit it off just like that. 
Oh, they were good friends, yes. Emerson went out of his way, and they had a marvelous correspondence for years. But I've always thought, good Lord, and Emerson, this sanguine man who really did feel good about life, and Carlyle, this crusty, crusty yes, strange, eccentric fellow. It's very strange. So skip over that, and let's go on past self-reliance to circles, the next one. I won't do too much of this much, but... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it's two o'clock. Let's um. Yeah, one sixty-eight is the page. Let's stop here for about uh, four minutes. We started a couple minutes late, so let's take a short break and then come back and we'll start to watch Emerson moderate as experience comes up against his uh, philosophy. Emerson never put his belief in the intrinsic goodness of man up against the world and held it as a wall. In fact, Emerson believed strongly that the reality of life is, is change, flux, as a, was a word that Emerson and Whitman would use, um, and that the only way to successfully live a life is constantly to be alert and open, malleable. I'm not sure what word you would like. Look at the bottom of the page on 168. Circles in the extremely important image for Emerson. We've already seen him talk about circles there. Uh, what this essay does is set up experience somewhat like this. And, and the, the essay experience, we'll look at later on, is, uh, is exemplary of this. We are always bounded by whatever our particular moment in time might be in terms of the vision, vision of the world around us. Is, I am limited right now by my age, by my family, my job. I cannot be the person I was when I was 25. If I'm the same person I was when I was 25, then I have uh, I've calcified. I've turned into stone. That is, the man I was that many years ago was limited and perceived the world through the years, 25 years he lived, when he, he lived to that age. I've lived quite a few years since then. And the same thing is true with you. If you are if you can say with pride, I haven't changed in the last 50 years, you shouldn't be saying it with pride. <laughs> okay. The point is you have, you have aged and you've grown and you've learned life, and if you're responding to life, uh, you are seeing things new. And I suspect every one of us is saying, I wish I had known 20 years ago what I know now. And Emerson says the way you imagine this as a, as a thinker or a member is to think of life as Right? This is the limit, this circle is the limit of my perception and my seeing of life now. I cannot see the world as a 50 year old man. I won't for 10 more years. And whatever that gives me is something I have to wait for. What I must do as a, an adult then is to consistently break through the barriers that surround me, the circle that limits me to being a 40 year old person. And Emerson says you, in order to survive, you break through. And once you've broken through a new experience, a new age, name what it might be, you'll find that you can look back and see more clearly what you had and what you were. But having broken through this circle is merely a growing of perception. There's another barrier right there. And you have to break through that. And once you get out there, <coughs> Emerson is going to say that actually all of life is a continual breaking through the barriers of perception that limit us where we are. And if you're lying on your deathbed, age 125, and you and you give up and say, ah, now I know it all, you've made a mistake because there still is another barrier out there that's holding you in. There's no end to this. So the image of circles is very important, as you can imagine. It's just continually keep asking, continually, continually keep learning. My students ask me why I like teaching down here and why I've been doing it now for 47 years, right? And I say because the nice thing about this group as an audience is that you're mature people. That's a nice word, right? Mature human beings. It's who, you're mature human beings who have not stopped it. You're still open to ideas. And most people, once they've reached their adulthood, as Emerson would say, alas, turn off their interest in the world around them and stay where they were when they're 40 for the rest of their lives. And the idea of continually reading and being open and excited with ideas is what Emerson says breaks us through, seeing new, constantly looking back. 
And he says, you see evidence of this in the world around you, in the bottom of this page. There are no fixtures in nature. That takes you back to Uriel, you see. Of course, what we, what we and as narrow people want to do is to fix things nice, organize them, put them in slots. The universe is fluid and volatile. Permanence is but a word of degrees. Is that true? <laughs> it seems to be as uh, contradictory. But he says, there is no such thing as permanence. I love you. So what does it mean? Right? It doesn't mean anything. As you would say, you say wedding vows, and you certainly say, I might my, need my throat. But uh, that doesn't mean a darn thing. 25 years later, there hasn't been a continual affirmation of that. I mean, a, 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 a promise, a swearing, a state, and I hate you forever. I suspect all of you who've had teenagers have come across the son or the daughter who says, right, you're the worst person I ever came across, I'll never come back, and five years later, they're there holding you in their lap or something, right? <laughs> that's, Mark, that's Mark Twain again, who said, when I was 16, I thought my father was the dumbest man in the world, and when I was 21, I was amazed at how much the old man had learned in five years. <laughs> None of these things last in Emerson's eyes. Our globe, seen by God, is transparent law, not a mass of facts. The law dissolves the fact and holds it fluid. Our culture is the predominance of an idea which draws after it this dream of cities and institutions. Let us rise into another idea and it disappear. This morning's lecture by American list students, the moving from revolutionary period into the early national period, and I was trying to get them to see what happens when you move from the neoclassical image of the world to the romantic image of the world. The radical shift in values. It's, take nature alone. The 18th century with its formal gardens, you can see Versailles, everything is clipped, well, reason, logic, mathematics. The 19th century, profusion. A total shift in, in, in perception of what is beautiful. But if you asked Alexander Pope what is beautiful, or Samuel Johnson, and you showed him a 19th century garden, he would say, good Lord, that's chaos. But beauty is still, is still beauty, all the same. And we step back, and we, you and I have the right to say, sure, Walpole's garden was beautiful, and so was Pope's. But the image of beauty changes. Many skirts versus, you know, the, the girls in high school now are starting to wear Saddle shoes with white socks rolled down. Oh, no. <laughs> My sister wore those in 1954. And uh, for the last 15 years, a girl wouldn't be caught dead in one of those saddle shoes. But now, right, the net plus ultra of shoes. <clears throat> the Greek sculpture is all melted away. I don't want to go back that far. <laughs> the Greek sculpture is all melted away as if it had been statues of ice. Here and there are solitary figure or fragment remaining as we see flecks and scraps of snow left in cold dells and mountain uh, clefts in June and July. For the genius that created it creates now somewhere else. The Greek letters last a little longer, but we are already passing under the same sentence and tumbling into the inevitable pit which the creation of new thought opens for the old. New continents are built out of the ruins of an old planet. The new races fed out of a decomposition of the foregoing. New arts destroy the old. <coughs> I'm sure you've all come across these ideas in other forms. What is the problem with Hellenism? If you don't about Hellenism. The trouble with Hellenism as an art, as a creative uh, genius for a culture, is that it was imitative of, Hel of the Hellenic faith. So that, uh, by definition, Hellenism simply cannot create natural Greek statues because they just wanted to do over again what was already done. And Emerson's point is, any culture that just imitates what was already beautiful. The Pidia, is it Pidias? It's a great self-sufficiency. Pidias was a genius, working in his time. But the, Hel the Hellenic artist trying to create a statue just like Pidias is in a sense a tool. So you've got to create mm -hmm. for your own time. But in the sense that the pre-Raphaelites did the same thing. Yes, and that's why pre-Raphaelite art has not held up to the, right. to the standards of time. They wanted to go back. You can't do that. You've got to write for your own time. That is, do you hear her point? The, pre, the future of art was not with Rossetti and Brown. It was with the uh, Impressionists uh, who were scorned. You could buy an Impressionist painting for $5 and a loaf of bread right at one time. But they were where the future was. The trouble is how do you find that future as it's being born? 
Okay, let's go on. You admire this power of granite, weathering the hurts of so many ages. Yet, a little waving hand built this huge wall, and that which builds is better than that which is built. There's Ruskin. The Gothic cathedrals are wonderful, not because those cathedrals are beautiful to see, but because they represent a spirit in an age where ordinary working people created as part of their ordinary life. The masons and the sculptures who made Notre Dame. Notre Dame is wonderful because of what made it, not because it's there. Anyway, it's prison, yeah. The hand that builds can topple it down much faster. Better than the hand, a nimbler was the invisible thought which wrought through it. And thus ever behind the coarse effect is a fine cause, which being narrowly seen is the effect of a finer cause. Everything looks permanent until it's equally known. Permanence is a word of degrees. And this paragraph starts out, every man <coughs> has a key, and that key is his thought. It's not his body, it's not his health. I just finished reading uh, to my uh, juniors the story of the devil in Tom Walker by Washington Irving, who we've not done here by the way, in recent years. Uh, and, and Tom Walker makes a pact with the devil, and he ends up with all, all this wealth, and when he disappears, all that wealth turns into ashes scrapings and shards, and the devil takes them away. The key to Tom Walker wasn't his ma amassed wealth, it was his greed. You saw that in person. Uh, let's look at one other paragraph here. Pass over to page 176. Here is Emerson's most, I think, powerful paragraph about what he wants to do with you with, with kind of as such as the ones we've just been reading. Shake us up and get us away from adoration of artifacts. You have to get through the essay by reading this far to see where it comes from. I am not careful to justify myself. All of his life, people have said to him, explain where you come from. Justify. If you know the man who said consistency and uh, conformity can go to the blazes for me, you also know that Emerson is not going to go to great lengths to explain every source of every idea. I own... I am gladdened by seeing the predominance of the saccharine principle throughout vegetable nature. <laughs> yeah, you can rearrange that a little bit. Uh, this is Emerson, still in his early, yeah, he's lived a while since the earliest. This is uh, after nature, after self-reliance, after the American scholar. He still believes pretty strongly in what he calls the saccharine principle, and that means sweet. Uh, that in nature, vegetable nature is really good. This is written before Tennyson wrote about nature of bread and tooth and claw. The memoriam is not yet in the past. By the way, we should do Tennyson someday, too. <laughs> Come to think of it. Uh, so he says, I own, I'm, pl I'm pleased that at the very core of, the core of nature is sweetness, goodness. Um, and not less by beholding in morals that unrestrained inundation of the principle of good into every chink and hole that selfishness has left open. See how good you think things are? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yea, into selfishness and sin itself I find goodness. So that no evil is pure, nor hell itself without its extreme satisfactions. That's her hetero her 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 heresy, yes. But, by the way, if you read Paradise Lost, you know that those devils down there and hell have a certain amount of pride in being where they are. Don't they? <laughs> and they wouldn't go back to heaven if he'd let them back. <laughs> but lest I should mislead any when I have my own head and obey my will. Let me remind the reader that I am only an experiment. Do not set the least value on what I do, or the least discredit on what I do not, as if I pretended to settle anything as true, or, as true or false. I unsettle all things. No facts are to be sacred, none are profane. I took the experiment, an endless secret, no past at my back. Pretty good, isn't it? Constant. Then he goes on to talk in these terms about constant succession of circles. All right, let's pass through circles. You see all these uh, nice uh, letters and uh, excerpts from the journals along the way.
Yes, turn to the Transcendentalist on page 192 and 193. This is an essay that is quite important for anyone who wants to understand what this famous term actually means. It's in this essay that Emerson sits down and speaks in terms of what transcendentalism and idealism mean as opposed to materialism. <coughs> he sets up quite the tag <coughs> on the material frame of mind. There's the bottom of the uh, page on 192. He says, as thinkers, mankind have ever divided into two sects, materialists and idealists. Well, you don't have to guess what side of that fence Emerson is on. He's a transcendentalist, and transcendentalists are by nature, by code, idealists. The first class founding on experience, the second on consciousness. Consciousness means what you go through, what comes to you through your mind, through your insight. It's not reason. It doesn't put on reason. But material is what you get from your exterior experience. Ideal is what you come to through your, through your sense. The second class, the first class, beginning to think from the data of the senses, the second class perceive that the senses are not final and say, the senses give us representations of things, but they are not things themselves, they cannot tell. I am not this body sitting here. I am buried and buried in something that you cannot find by looking at this and body or this job or this life. There's something crucially inside you that makes you special. You're a Christian, I want to see it. Go down to the <coughs> middle of that page. Oh, in the middle of that paragraph, I guess. These two modes of thinking are both natural, but the idealist contends that his way of thinking is in higher nature. Every materialist will be an idealist, but an idealist can never go back to be a materialist. The point, if you start out as a materialist, the natural experience you have with things will make you an idealist eventually. And if you believe that that's the only way you can go on the road, and the hardest core of Marxists who believes in materialism will have to ultimately go through facts. Think about the meaning of facts, and that destroys materialism. But you can't go backwards. You can't start off to be an idealist and find yourself satisfied with things and their simplicity. The idealist, in speaking of events, sees them as spirits. He does not deny the sensuous fact, by no means. But he will not see that alone. He does not deny the presence of this table, this chair, and the walls of this room. But he looks at these things as the reverse side of the tapestry, as the other end, each being a sequel or completion of a spiritual fact which nearly concerns him. Nearly means closely, not almost. And that is all that these chairs are on this floor, you people are to me, is a representation of a of a spiritual truth which is very, very important to me. It's, a, it's near to me in its meaning. This manner of looking at things transfers every object in nature from an independent and anomalous position without there into the consciousness. It brings it in. Even the materialist, Kondiya, mm -hmm. perhaps the most logical expounder of materialism, was constrained to say, though we should soar into the heavens but we should sink into the abyss, we never go out of ourselves. It is always our own thought that we perceive. So what more could an idealist say? True. The materialist, secure in the certainty of sensation, mocks at fine spun theories like stargazers and dreamers and believes that his life is solid, that he at least takes nothing for granted, but knows where he stands and what he does Hear how easy it is to show him that he also is a phantom, walking and working and in phantom, and that he need only ask a question or two beyond his daily questions to find his solid universe growing dim and impalpable before his sense. The sturdy capitalist, no matter how deep and square on blocks of quincy granite, he lays the foundation of his bank account or exchange, must set it, at last, not on a cube corresponding to the angles of the structure, but on a mass of unknown material and solidity, red hot, or 
white hot, perhaps at the core, which rounds off to an almost perfect spherity that lies floating in soft air and goes spinning away, dragging bank and banker with it at a rate of thousands of miles the hour. He knows not whither. See the point? I, lo I love that passage. He says, the most conservative Republican banker in the world who builds his bank of Quincy Granite, Quincy, Massachusetts, talking about here, that is the strongest, you know, put your money in my bank. He says that banker does not put his blocks of granite on his specific form to structure it solid. He puts that bank, he says, on a mass of unknown materials and solidity, red hot or white hot, marvelous image. You're building your bank on the top of a Mount St. Helens, guys. <laughs> if you think you've got solidity at any moment, and then this marvelous image of of the earth right? spinning, he says, as the core was rounds off to almost perfect severity and floats in soft air and goes spinning away, bank and banker. <laughs> but life is nowhere near as uh, stable as you think it is. And the people up on the Kudu River found that out, didn't they? But they just pass it on. Take you right back to the poem I read two weeks ago. And he talks about the farmers who own this land. Right? Uh, this is my land. And I've got lawyers who've tied it up in, in my will so it will go on forever in my family. Earth laughs and flowers to see her boy proud of the earth and she's not. Same thing here. It goes spinning away, dragging bank and banker with it at a rate of thousands of miles the hour. He knows not whither. A bit of bullet now glimmering, now darkling through a small cubic space on the edge of an, an unimaginable pit of emptiness. And this wild balloon, it's, it's marvelous writing, by the way. You start off with one quick block of Quincy granite, and at the end of the sentence, you're, you're at the very edge of the universe, aren't you? In the midst of emptiness, how he turns the man's pride into his material object into nothing in the sky. And he, then he talks about the earth as a balloon, put a pin in it, bam, in which his whole venture is embarked. It's just a while, it's just a symbol of his whole stage and faculty. One thing at least is certain, he says is certain, and does not give me the headache that figures do not lie. The multiplication table has been hitherto found unimpeachable proof. And moreover, if I put a gold eagle in my safe, I'll find it again tomorrow. These are, for these thoughts, I know not think they are. They change and pass away. They ask him why he believes that an uniform experience will continue uniform, or on what grounds his faith and his figures, that he will perceive that his mental fabric is built up on dust and strain, on faith and comfort, as his cloud is. Very nice paragraph. The point, he says, if you talk to a banker, and the banker says, well, I know one thing, and that is two plus two is four, and if I take this silver dollar and put it in my safe, I will find it there in the morning. Emerson says, well, we can argue with that. Okay. But if you ask that banker, what do you think he's got to do? What does he tell you to do? What's the structure in your mind that gives value to two plus two is four, or I'll find my silver dollar in the bank? Morning. As soon as you ask a question to get him away from that metal fact, it'll just crumble, crumble right away. Because every banker knows that you think that all of this table, this is Tom Walker's gold, turns into chips of wood and it's all over. You can't take it with you, as they used to say. Or going to the going to the Bible, lost and rough, rust corrupt. Okay. Say with how much you made, but you're wrong on the inside, then the trouble lasts. So that's a piece of the transcendentalist. <coughs> Turn to 207. <coughs> you remember the you remember the uh, elegy on his son, Waldo? Here is Emerson thinking on this as Waldo dies from his journal. January twenty eighth. Two oh seven. January 28, 1842. Yesterday night, at 15 minutes after 8, a little wall that ended his life. Two days later, he pondered on the journal, January 30th. The boy, 
had his full swing in this world, I think. Never, I think, did a child enjoy more. He had been thoroughly respected by his parents and those around him, and not interfered with. And he had been the most fortunate in respect to the influence of dear him. For his Aunt Elizabeth had adopted him from his infancy and treated him ever with that plain and wise love which belonged to her, and as she had both of had never given him sugar bonds. So he was one to her and always signalized her visit, her arrival, and her visit to him, and left playmates, playthings, and all to go to her. Then Mary Russell had been his friend and teacher for two summers with true love and wisdom. Then Henry Thoreau had been one of the family for the last year, charmed Walder by the variety of toys, whistles, bolts, pop guns, and all kinds of instruments which he could make and mend, and possessed his love and respect by the gentle firmness with which he always treated him. Margaret Fuller and Caroline Sturgis had also marked the boy, caressed and conversed with him whenever they were here. Meantime, every day his grandmother gave him his reading lesson, and by patience taught him to read and spell, by patience and by love, for she loved him dearly. Mm. Sorrow makes us children, again, destroys all the senses of intellect, the wise and more nothing. On February 4th, several days later, he's gone through the morning. The days of our mourning ought, no doubt, to be accomplished ere this. And the innocent and beautiful should not be tolerated and gloomily lamented. But the music and fragrant thoughts and sordid recollections. Alas, I chiefly grieve that I cannot grieve. But this fact takes no more deep hold than other facts, is as dreamlike as they. A land that flame that will not burn, playing on the of my river. Every experience. Those that promise to be dearest and most pitiful will be too strong to keep up the wind. I think it makes me out of the candle of the fucking mark. Dear boy, too precious as you need to be able to be publicized to the waste and cut of the house of the sun. Strong and wise, confident and wisely happy. The beautiful creative color looks out from him and spoke of anything but chaos and interruption. Signify strength, unity, gladness, all united life. Mark Twain. I comprehend nothing of this fact that is bitter. Explanation I have none. Consolation none that rises out of the fact itself. Only that version. Only oblivion of this in pursuit of new objects. You can see from that selection how hard it was for him to come to terms with it. A variety of ways. I should, we should be good the time. The first passage. You can see that what he's doing there is finding validity in his love for Waldo by listing the names of people who preferred the boy. That whole passage is, well, mm -hmm. Margaret Fuller liked him, and so did Thoreau, and so did uh, Carolyn Sturgis, and all these people. As though, as though as he looks at his son, he thinks, could he really be as wonderful as I have thought? I see that entry as just self-argument. Could he have been? And then, as he goes on, you know, the loss, and falls into this, why am I not destroying myself with grief? Why did I get up this morning and have breakfast? And one of his later essays, he picks this up as a major point. He says, here I am one who's always wanted to get near truth. And what the strongest experiences of truth, he said, don't stay with us. You lose your son and you fall into grief and 40 days later you're eating breakfast? Why are you still alive? This, at one point he says, and I think it's experience, well, I, I, would, I would even take grief the loss of my son, if I could stick with truth that way. Even misery, if it were truth, would be worth having. But nothing that we have lacks. That's that constant change. Nature will not allow us to stabilize ourselves in one experience, one idea. And then he goes on to say, at this point, how do I feel? Bitter. I can't make any sense of this at all. He had not yet written the rest of the He couldn't put it into his philosophy. So ultimately, he's going to, he's going to argue it. It's quite a sad passage. Uh, by the way, one more on uh, page 209, April 14, 1842. If I should write an honest diary, what should I say? Alas, that life has happiness and shallowness. I have almost completed 39 years and have not yet adjusted my relation to my fellows in the planet and to my own work. All of it is too young or too old. I don't satisfy myself, how can I satisfy others? And there it is. Bad 
Passover, it will pass over the poet. This is an important essay on poetry. It will pass over politics, which is after that, and come to experience. Let's go all the way over to faith and then come back to experience. Turn to page 330. <coughs> Fate is an exceptionally important late essay. It really would take. I think I better not sit on the part table. It really would be uh, worthwhile to sit down and read it. Over through. It's one of his best later explorations of the limitations of life. And this essay is, in fact, about perceiving limitations. And the essay we're going to go back to in a few minutes, uh, experience, is another one of the same type. This is the result of having lived some years and having gone through some pain and loss and tragedy. He's trying to say, how do I keep my faith from my youth now that I've lived this many years? It It should bring memories in your mind at the end of eternity. He talks about being old and not being able to create, but keeping the faith confidence that the end of the trip is worth the, the, worth the voyage. So here he is looking at himself in his face. Halfway through the first paragraph. To me, the question of the times resolved itself into a practical question of the conduct of life. He's an idealist. He says, the problem we have is, okay, it's practical. But how do we live through life? That's a practical issue. How shall I live? You know, it's confidence to solve the times. And the word like incompetent is here, and it's going to be mature. Our geometry cannot stand the huge orbits of the prevailing ideas, behold their return, and reconcile their opposition. We can only obey our own polarity. It's fine for us to speculate and elect our course, if we must accept an irresistible dictation. Our first step to gain our wishes. In our first step to gain our wishes, we come upon immovable limitations. Do you hear the soberness of that? See, when you're 17, the world's your oyster. It's the old phrase. Anything can happen. Uh, when you're 18, by the time you're a senior, you're trying to realize that you're going to make choices. But young people, my son would ask you to choose two words to describe himself. Uh, he's a teacher uh, this fall. Uh, one of the two words he chose was perfect. It's <laughs> 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 a kind of, not, I thought I was a Calvinist, but <laughs> I think I must not be. Um, but at the age of 10, and he's 10 years old, and uh, as we were saying before lunch, uh, in Giselle, a 10-year-old boy is the perfect boy. They're confident, they're not going, they have not come into adolescence yet. They're, they love being 10. It's great being a boy and going with your dad. And so if, if anybody at any age will say, boy, I'm glad I'm me. He's probably a 10-year-old boy. But the, if, once you get out there, Emerson says the first time you set out to face the world, you're going to find yourself nose to nose with a wall. That is life. Halfway down the par next paragraph. We are sure that though we know not how, necessity does import liberty. In our things must be and must do. And that's the challenge of being an adult. You cannot be a uh, runner if you've only got one day. You can't be a father if you're a mother, if you're a woman. You cannot be a poet if you can't speak. Cannot be a disjigger if you're a weak one. Whatever it is, it's constantly up against reality and even by limitation. In other words, adulthood is constant frustration for him and for us. The individual with the world, my polarity with the spirit of the times. The riddle of the age is for each a private solution. If one would study his own time, it must be by this method of taking up in turn, each of the leading topics which belong to our scheme of human life, and by firmly stating all that is agreeable to experience on one, 
and doing the same justice to the opposing side and the others, the true limitations will appear. Let us state honestly the fact. Our America has had a superficial race. By the way, it's getting truer and truer. The uh, Civil War was coming out shortly. Mm -hmm. Turn it over to the next page, 332. Before this time, Emerson would say, look at nature and remember the word the saccharine traits, how even vegetable nature is sweet. By the time he comes to say it, he's, he's not going to be saying that. Nature is no sentimentalist. Now he said, this is 1852 uh, in memoriam, which is one of the benchmarks of Victorian literature in 1850. This idea of nature read into the saw, it's not easy. We're seeing nature in a new light. It's not just this because of these holistic universe where uh, innocent people romp around with tigers in paradise. Um, nature is no sentimentalist. It does not cost us or pamper us. We must see that the world is rough and surly. It will not mind drowning a man or woman. The swallows have shifted like a grain of dust. Well, that's what they're going to see. Not just, I'm thinking of, the, of uh, Governor Grassley coming over uh, on the Napar walking this man who was cursed the pilgrim being cursed by God and given us the feelings. The sailor who had said, all you people who are sick, you're going to die and I'm going to get your, your gift your money and have a good time with it. And God said, he was cursed one sick, cursed one sick, and cursed one dead, and cursed one overboard. God did that. You're in your God's providence. Uh-uh. Not now. Nature is just accurate. And if you get caught in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean without a life preserver, God's not going to do anything about it. Nature will help you down, or the ship, or nature is not feminine about these things. The cold, inconsiderate of persons, tingles your blood, benumbs your feet, freezes a man like an apple. You want to say, in terms of justice, it should not be this way. When I got up this morning, I had a straight bite from the car, and I only had thin gloves. You say, God. This is Gary, you're freezing my hand. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Sorry. The diseases, the elements, fortune, gravity, lightning, respect no person. The way of providence is a little rude. A little rude, I'd like a little more currency here, the way of providence. The habit of snake and spider, the snap of the tiger and other leapers and bloody jumpers, the crackle of the bones of his prey in the coil of the anaconda. These are in the system. In our habits are like there. You have just dined. And however scrupulously the slaughterhouse is concealed in a graceful distance of miles, there is simplicity, expensive races, race living at the expense of race. Very point. We are not free. We do not like to think of the cute little furry animal being crunched by the python. And everything says, my dear young man, my dear young lady, that safety lady today was bumped in the head uh, and slipped maybe alive in our last week in the slaughterhouse on the other end of our age. Right? What do we do as human beings? We, put, we draw those curtains from the unpleasant facts of where this day came from. But the fact is, nature says, or the and we participate in that. You see, he's still doing the same, it's the same process, which is look at nature to see what you are, but now Emerson has shifted that, that prism, this is a radically shifting it, so that we see that we participate in all of this. Most of us do not like to think about slaughterhouses at all. I suppose some of you like me. I was raised in a town that had a packing plant, and uh, all through childhood you could smell drums and all armors. And you could hear the cows every time you went to high school, you could smell that from it. And people always just, oh, couldn't stand it. Yeah. As I got on and reading Eric's, I always thought, maybe every town should have a snow and packing plant. Just because now, when you go by armors, it's all mechanized, goes to meat. They might as well, well be a church. You know, unless there's something in there being turned into luncheon meat. The planet is liable to shocks from comets, perturbation from planets. Rending from earthquake and volcano, alterations of climate, processions of equinoxes. Rivers <coughs> dry up by opening of the forest. The sea changes its bed. Towns and counties fall into it. 
At Lisbon, an earthquake killed men like flies. That was one of the major natural experiences of the 18th century. You know what great work came out of the earthquake? A French writer? Mm -hmm. You heard of Candide by Voltaire? Mm -hmm. The book Candide came from the experience of the Lisbon earthquake. It is not the best of all possible worlds. Now that you're in, the, in Lisbon when the earthquake is back, it's pretty good business. At Naples, three years ago, 10,000 persons were crushed in a few minutes. The scurvy at sea, the sword of the climate in the west of Africa, <coughs> at Cayenne, at Panama, in New Orleans, cut off men like a massacre. Our western prairie shakes with fever and ague, the cholera, the smallpox. Now, please go on. I think it's just it's a wonderful paragraph. He's giving us as much shock of truth as we can take at the beginning of this. And so he says, but these shocks and ruins, that is, natural ones, are less destructive to us than the stealthy power of other laws which act on us daily. And the steps of ends to means say, what is say? Always live for other people our ends. Never use other people as means. You use people as means and maybe find tools you can humanize yourself in them as well. They need that we continue to give up our ends for the sake of our means. We lose, we lose control. And that's what faith does to us. Organization tyrannizing over character. So what am I? I have this character and I allow my limitation, organization of my body, my personality, my temperament, my money situation. All of this holds me down, my character, my, my plan, my goal. The menagerie of forms and powers of the spine in the book of faith, the bill of the bird, the skull of the snake, determines tyrannically its limits. A snake can never be anything but a snake. A bird will be a bird. That bill determines that it's a bird, it's not going to become a human being because we've got that. So is the scale of race, of temperament, so is sex, so is climate, so is the reaction of talent, imprisoning the vital power in certain directions. Every spirit makes its pulse. That's the word. 